Okay, here's our outline for the day. And uh, this is this and the next lecture, we're going to bring it all together. And our main target for the semester, the periodic table, uh, we'll talk about next Tuesday. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about quantum theory and actually we'll talk about guitars. I have a question. Um, raise your hand if you have a guitar. Sweet. Now, raise your hand if you would like to bring your guitar to class on Tuesday. Raise your hand. Somebody, okay. What kind of guitar is it? Is it acoustic or electric? Bring your acoustic, simpler, uh, and your tuner. So you tune it up when you get in here. Can you get here early? I mean, do, do you normally get here a few minutes before I start? Okay. All right, so and you'll be starting up here in the front, and we're going to listen to some music, some basic chords and stuff. I'll talk to you. Can you send me a course, uh, a message in web courses and tell me, Dr. B, I'm bringing my guitar. All right, and we'll coordinate on, you know, stuff. All right. Um, so SSG signups... Uh, will be this this actually um, Monday evening, and I've got meeting info from a lot of the SSG, but not everybody yet. Oh, okay. I guess I've got it from one more person than I thought. Anyways, you SSG leaders, uh, one more round, and and that'll be good. Then you'll be released from the final. And so if you have a box of kittens, see that? A box of kittens, eight times nine, 72 lives in a box of kittens. Let's talk about homework 19, number four. There was a little bit of controversy about it. I got cornered by an irate SSG leader this morning. Uh, She's shaking her head. She's saying, no, Dr. B, it wasn't like that. It's this one. Let's take a look at it. If you, if you didn't figure this one out, I'll just kind of talk my way through it. Um, the target particle is the proton. All right, now this is a wrinkle on the problems, that Maria, that we did work on, which were either the leftmost particle or the rightmost particle. But doing one of the interior particles of the linear charge array is a righteous task. This one was designed to be fairly nice. You may have noticed. Hey, however many newtons I get on the proton from this electron on the right, I get the same number of newtons um, from this uh, electron on the left, and they cancel. So, if, for instance, this one, it says um, if the nearest neighbor interaction force is 84 nanonewtons. All right, so you get 84 uh, nanonewtons to the right from this proton, or excuse me, on the proton from this electron out on the right. And then you get a leftward 84 nanonewtons from this job, this electron um, pulling to the left. So that's 84 and a negative 84, ding, exactly zero. But you still have this baby, the far left electron. Now that's two distance units out, William de Klerk. So you just take your nearest neighbor interaction and divide by four and then figure out if it's left or right. Now in this particular case, 84 divided by four is 21. My answer is negative 21 because it's leftward. And um, I got three points on this. You can see I got three points. Now, some of you uh, did not get your points on that because it was 
set, one of the things that's very difficult with Canvas is getting these formula questions to do what I want. And so I thought I had this one working properly, but it's still not working properly. If you had an odd number of, it, it, it's, it asks here, uh, and I, I thought I had it set to round up, to look for answers to the nearest tenth of a nanonewton, either left or right. But if you have an odd number of nanonewtons for the nearest neighbor interaction force, so like 89 nanonewtons, an odd number divided by 4 is always going to be either a 0.25, something, something, 0.25, or something, something, 0.75. And web course is, is mishandling those ones, and you may have noticed the pattern that if you had an odd number, um, it blew it. it you, you had the right answer, and it didn't, it choked on it. All right. And so uh, we're going to have more homework this weekend. And as I mentioned, this is the last regular homework. Today's the last official clicking for your clicker grade, your participation grade. Uh, because on Tuesday next week, we'll have a bonus clicking review, last half of class. But um, this weekend, you'll have a regular homework. And you'll have and you'll have some brain burners on there, and some more stuff like what we talked about today, and then you'll have a mega review that's due at the end of next week, next Friday, in exam week, uh, and that'll be for bonus points, a nice study tool that'll have a question or two um, from the beginning of the semester in January all the way up till today, and so. Uh, and all the way up till actually till Tuesday, I'll probably put a few uh, questions in there for Tuesday. Uh, anyways, so you're gonna have a bunch of homework. I'll put some more of these brain burners in there, and this time for sure and without a doubt, I think what I'll do is set them to uh, go for the nearest hundredth of a nanometer, and that should that should work. Okay, it shouldn't be too bodacious. All right. Now any comments or questions about the homework other than that? Yes, Celine. For the mega review? Uh, Celine's question was, are we only going to have one time for the big mega review uh, homework? And the answer to that is N-O. You'll have a bunch of attempts. I'm, I might even give you six attempts. Because it's a... It's a study tool, and I'm giving you bonus points to study. So, I mean, so a so as a study tool, it'll be nice to be able to, you know, crash and burn a couple times, and then you know get your answers sorted out, study with friends, figure out every single one, and then crush it at the end, you know, in your last attempt, if not sooner. But the the mega review in class next Tuesday, that's a one shot deal. Okay, because we'll be clicking in class. Another question. Uh, Gabby. Yeah, it's leftward. Yeah, this, um, Gabby's question, can you explain why it's negative 21? The constituent forces, i.e., the individual pairwise forces that make up the net, um, the constituent force from this one the constituent force from this one, they cancel out, you know, 84 and negative 84. The only one that you have to do is this one. It's 84 divided by 4, and it's leftward. It's pulling the target particle, this proton, to the left, okay? And so the size of it is 84 divided by 4, and because it's leftward, it gets a minus sign, all right? It does, but we're, we're trying to figure out the force on this particle. All right, and it's it, and it it's it's something that you've got to try to train your your mind to to remember. You know what's what's the what's the force on my target? Because it's an it, it is an interaction, the Coulomb interaction. It'll generate forces on the proton and a force, and the proton will generate a force on this electron out here to the left. 
Okay, but we don't, we're not trying to figure out what's happening to that one on the left. I mean, if we want to figure out the net force on everything, yeah, we could do it. Okay, but we're just, you know, for, for each problem, I'm just asking you to do one target part. All right, now last time we talked about the monopole and dipole electric fields. We did some sketching. Here they are again. And the basic idea uh, for the monopole field, or in other words, the single charge or single uh, charged object, is that the field lines go outward um, from a positive charge and we draw them inward from, or excuse me, inward to a negative charge. So whatever field lines that you have sprouting out of a positive, they're going to land on a negative sign somewhere. We, we made a sketch of a dipole field, a plus and a minus sign. Here's a better sketch of it, or of a dipole, um, with a positive on the left and a negative on the right. Now, each of these positive charges um, produce 16 field lines each. And, you know, if you want to sketch that, go ahead and try to sketch that. Um, they each um, produce or land, um, the positive produces, the negative lands uh, 16 field lines. This means that the magnitude of the charges are equal. Uh, even though they're opposite signs. So the field lines launch from the positive charge. And the, the direction of the field line, remember, is given by the, in, the direction that a little teeny positive test charge would be accelerated if it were placed anywhere around this charge, that, this source charge. So here's your source charge, this positive. And if you put a little teeny positive test charge up here to the northwest, it'd get, a, it'd get a, an acceleration out in this direction, a force, an electric force. Now, if you put a teeny positive test charge here, right on the symmetry line, you'd get a rightward force. You'd get some, you'd get some push, oh, some repulsion force. If you're up here at the center of one of these field lines, You'll get some outward push from the proton, and you'll get some downward pu pull toward the electron. And the net of those two is rightward. Um, the field lines land uh, in equal numbers on the negative charge, also indicating uh, where the teeny test charge would accelerate. So if you've got a teeny positive test charge um, somewhere near this um, negative charge here, this negative source charge, uh, they're going to be accelerating. That teeny positive test charge is going to be accelerating inward. Now this one's a nice diagram compared to the one that um, that I had over here. This one was kind of this was kind of shaky. But the basic idea is found in uh, this one here uh, with this kind of um, precisely sketched in. It's, it's actually pretty nice artwork. It is not easy to do this in an accurate way, but this one's actually pretty accurate. And uh, so the field lines are, are important. They indicate the relative size of the charges. So these two charges, you don't know if, if it's a Coulomb or, you know, an elementary charge, but you do know whatever they are, they're the same size. Get your clickers out because we're going to ask some clicking questions here in just a minute. Let's take a look at this one. This is, a, this is a little bit of an extension on what we talked about last time. This is the dipole field of unequal charges. Now, I'm going to ask you a clicker question in a second. So just kind of eyeball this one. And because this the same image is going to be in your eye clicker question. And this one you can see is unequal charges. And you might think to yourself, Dr. B, how do you figure out that the two charges are different sizes? You know, one of them's bigger, one of them's smaller. Blue is negative, 
Red is positive. Um, but how do you figure that, you know, that one is bigger and one is, one's bigger, one's smaller, one's positive, one's negative. The color tells you whether it's positive. I mean, I give you that, whether it's positive or negative. But let's think about that unequal dipole. All right, now I'm going to give you a question. And what I want you to do is think it over and talk with your neighbor. If you have a neighbor, Alex, that will talk to you. If you're still friends. Okay. And here's your question. Based on counting field lines, what are the possible charges on this unequal dipole? We know they're unequal. Well, which, which set of numbers is... Now, talk that over with your classmate. Or think it over with your brain. I see people pointing with their pencils and their pens. Kind of. Sava, why aren't you looking at that one? <laughs> okay. Unbelievable. It's like a reverse polarity situation. I see you guys talking it over. That's good. Remember, in this class, if... The key to, to crushing my exams is to be able to think. And talking stuff over in class helps you think things through on the exam. 30 seconds. Ten seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Huh. Very, very interesting. Let me start. Okay. Here's the results, and as you can see, there's a few people voted for A and B, a pile of you voted for C, and a fairly good smaller pile voted for D, and the answer is C. Now, all right, now if you, there's a good fraction of you that answered incorrectly. So let's take a look at why this is. Let's count those field lines. All right, here we go. We're going to start with the field lines that push out of the positive charge. All right, so here we go. I'm going to burn them in. Number one, and I'm going to go around counterclockwise. Number two, number three. Number four, and now I'm above the positive charge. I'm working my way around. Here's number five, six, seven, ocho, nine, nueve, nueve. I only know a few span. You know, it's technically I'm Hispanic, right? But I don't even know Spanish. I'm a... 10. Okay, now we're down below. 
11, 12. Now we're coming back up. 13, 14, 15. So positive 15 is kosher for the pot. So it could be 15 E or 15 Coulomb, or it could be 150 Coulomb, but some multiple of 15. All right? Question. It's not because I haven't specified what unit. The, the, the drawing of the field lines is artificial. You have to decide how many you want per coulomb or how many or if you just want see because if you have um, an electron you know that's only one unit so you can't say well how many how many uh, how many field lines per fundamental charge so if you say so here's the thing if you say that you uh, you know an electron gets 12 in all three dimensions okay inward then what does a Coulomb get? That's Because a Coulomb is 10 to the 18 um, electrons, a negative 1 Coulomb. Okay, so that's a huge number. So you're going to have a zillion arrows, and you can't map that out. So whenever you, you know, depending on the size of charge you have, you have to decide, okay, for every Coulomb, I'm going to give 12. Or for every half a Coulomb, I'm going to give 5. Or, you know, some, some unit. And then you try to draw it in as well as you can. So these field lines only tell you the pro relative proportion. Let's try the negative side over here. Okay, so here are the field lines. Here's number one. I'm starting on this central field line between the two uh, charges, the two monopoles. Okay, this is my horizontal. By the way, guys, draw a, a dotted line, uh, or I guess you, if you haven't sketched this, try to sketch it. And label this horizontal line right down the pipe here as a horizontal symmetry axis. Okay? And then draw... Um, that's the only symmetry axis that we've got on this one. Anyways, uh, I'm starting on the symmetry axis between the two charges. One. And these are blue. Okay? So this is blue number one. Blue number two. I'm working clockwise now. Blue number three, I'm above the negative charge. Blue number four, whoa, I'm all the way around over here. Blue number five, blue number six, blue number seven, and blue number ocho. All right. Now, this diagram has got some features to it that I want to emphasize to you. And this Right in here, this area here is kind of shaky. I, I, I did not produce this diagram. It was given to me. Um, I might have stolen it from the Internet. But at any rate, it's a little shaky in here. Those two field lines shouldn't touch. Uh, they should be a little, they should land. Um, they should land at the same place here. Uh, anyway, uh, so that's, that's what we've got. A couple things about this. The up-down symmetry is still intact, but the right-left symmetry is broken. And I want you to use that, that verb, broken. Okay, broken symmetry. We've broken the symmetry, uh, or this charge array um, has broken the symmetry of left-right. It still has up-and-down symmetry, so it looks the same above, at least it's supposed to, uh, as it does below. All right, so up and down is good. Left and right is broken. Now, the reason that that's important for us, the symmetry of this array uh, is a little bit unequal, uh, or it's a little bit broken, not completely. The reason that that's important is um, it applies, Jason, uh, to molecules, for instance, the water molecule. Go ahead and make a sketch of your water molecule. Oxygen is an atom with eight protons in the nucleus. And of course, a hydrogen nucleus is a single proton. Now, oxygen has eight protons, eight neutrons, most oxygen. And always eight protons, sometimes more than eight neutrons. 
Uh, hydrogen is usually, most hydrogen is one proton, and that's it, in the nucleus. Okay, so left right here, or from the hydrogen end to the oxygen end of this molecule, this water molecule, you don't have symmetry. But on either side of this dark black arrow here, you do have symmetry. All right? And as I've mentioned before, this angle between the hydrogen to the center of the oxygen and back out to the other hydrogen is a very precise angle. We can measure it, and we can actually calculate it using quantum physics techniques. Um, and it's, it's not 90, so try to make it a little bit bigger. It's like 105 or something like that. I always have to look it up. It's, uh, it's a little bit bigger than 90, so it's, it's obtuse, but not by much. All right, so this whole idea of the dipole field and unequal dipoles is important for molecules. Magnetic field, this, this is the other thing that we sketched. Um, and I talked to you about the right-hand rule. Now, the whole idea of the right-hand rule is to use your right hand. I remember one time I was in grad school, I was working on a magnetism problem, and I was writing down my answers, you know, so I'm, I'm working my calculator and writing with my right hand, and I'm using my, my other hand, and, I, you know, I was looking up the answer for this problem I was working on, and I kept getting the wrong direction. I think, come on, Thomas, what? And then I realized I, I was writing with my right hand, and I was using my left hand for the right hand rule. And so, so that's, that's not going to work at all. All right, so the only time I ever help students, as much as I love you, is on exams where I have a question about the right-hand rule. If I see somebody going like this and trying to figure out, I'll, I'll say, hey, yo, other hand, your other right hand. Use your, you know, right? Because I I, I've been in that mess before. Anyways, here's the right-hand rule. You... Put your thumb in the direction of the current, and then the direction of the field lines is in the same direction as the curvature of the fingers on your right hand. All right, so here's, now I've tilted this um, current axis. It goes right through the middle of this guy's hand. All right, so here it is. All right, so it's pretty parallel. And so what that means is, in this perspective, um, it comes up and over in the manner of the right hand. All right, now we talked about that last time. It is also in your textbook, your e-text. Now, what I want to do now with you is talk about, uh, this is where we, we left off. We didn't quite have time to sketch this one. Um, if you have a loop of current like this, you know, so this red uh, circle, uh, so we're kind of looking down on it in perspective. The magnetic field at the very center of the loop is indicated by the thumb. So it's a di slightly different right-hand rule. You curl your fingers in the sense of the current. Okay, the fingers of your right hand. And then you say to yourself, okay, at the center of that loop, my magnetic field points in the direction that my right thumb points. So for us, let me go walk over here. Okay, so for us, the right hand rule is kind of cutting around like this. So my thumb is pointing up, and, and actually it's kind of in perspective, so it's kind of pointing up this way. Um, If you stack a bunch of them together on the left, you get this magnetic field over here. So this image right here, that's a stack of loops. The fancy name for that, I'll spell it out for you. It's a solenoid. Now let me spell that. S-O-L-E-N-O-I-D. Uh, fancy name for a coil wrapped around 
itself many, many times. Solenoid, S-O-L-E-N-O-I-D. I don't know what Greek word that's from. If you put a piece of iron, Anna, right through the middle of that solenoid, it makes the magnetic field even stronger. If you have a car and your starter has ever gone out uh, and you had to replace it, which I've had to do myself, uh, the starter has a solenoid in it. It's a big electromagnet. And it's got a big iron core and a lot more um, loops of wire than this diagram. Now here's the cool thing about it. This is an electromagnet, basically. When current flows, you get a magnetic field like this. Here's a bar magnet over here. Okay, so the N is up here, and the S is over here. And so this is the... So for magnetic field, magnetic field lines are always loops. They're never straight out like spokes of a wheel. They always curl back around and form a loop. The loops tend to go in towards the south end. To, excuse me, the S end. And they tend to sprout from the N end. Now we could have done things completely different from that, but that's how we um, have set up the convention for naming the um, ends of a bar magnet, the N and the S. Now, why do we call it N? We call it N because that N points towards the North Pole. Right? If that were a little teeny compass needle, that's the end that would point to the North Pole of Earth, which is where the magnetic pole is, up by Santa's work little bit south of Santa's workshop at the very north pole. So here's my question for you. You know, uh, opposites attract. If you, if you know an engineer and you want to burn their grits, ask them this question. Is the magnetic pole of Earth up in the Arctic N or S? So in other words, our geomagnetic pole that's up in northern Canada, up there in the where the polar bears live, is that an N or an S? And so what you want to do for, for an engineer, engineering major, is he, he might be able to give you an answer. And then ask him, well, why is that? And you'll totally get him hornswoggled. Now, let's look at this. Okay, Karina? So that end, end of the magnet points towards Santa's workshop. So that means it's going to point towards an S. Because remember, S... S and N attract. N and N, N and N repel. So it's not going to go toward the N. Earth has an N, Earth has an S, but the one by Santa's workshop up in northern Canada is an S. So ask your engineering, why is the, the north magnetic pole of the Earth actually a south magnetic pole? And watch them squirm. It's a lot of fun. Anyway, these are dipole fields. So this is not an accident. You know, a bar magnet and a, an electric dipole having the same source, it is not a, an accident. It is something essential about the electromagnetic interaction that this occurs. Now, I'm going to ask you one more question. And I'm going to try to write a question on your homework and probably a question on the final exam based on this question. If you have a current on a straight wire, so let's say the electrons are going through this wire um, 
from right to left. So the electrons are going this way. And let's say that the speed of the electrons is 100 meters per second. Okay. Okay, so you're standing here in the classroom and the electrons, Jonathan, are sliding through here at 100 meters per second. And so we'll call that a negative 100 meters per second because it's to the left. Okay, so the electrons are going negative 100 meters per second from right to left. And so now what if you, now 100 meters per second, that's about 225 miles an hour, 227 miles an hour, something like that. So we could do that in a car. And students, in a real wire, the electrons don't move don't really move very fast at all. It's, it's actually very slow. The signal passes, you know, you turn the lights on, they go on almost instantaneously. The electric field sets up, but the electrons don't actually move very fast. Anyways, let's say we're going here at 100 meters per second, negative, for the electrons. And let's say that you have uh, a Lamborghini, okay? And Logan, your Lam and you get your Lamborghini, and you know, there's no cops around. So you get that Lamborghini up to 100 meters per second, all right? So, but don't turn on the flux capacitor because you don't want to go back into the future. We're just going straight ahead. All right, so you get this Lamborghini going negative 100 meters per second, all right? All right, so yeah, we could do all that. So a, a stream of electrons, and you know the stream of electrons is moving, and so therefore you have a, a straight line current from right to left, 100 meters per second leftward, no problem. So you're going to have those right-hand rule field lines. They're going to come up out of the floor over by where you are, and they're going to go down into the floor in, in behind the screen here. Okay, so they're going to be going like this. All right. And so you have field lines, but write this question down. If I am in the car, traveling to the left at 100 meters per second. What do I observe? What do I see? In other words, if you're moving at the same speed as those electrons, what do you see? You know, so if you're here in the classroom and those electrons are zipping by, you can take a compass and you can, you know, the compass needle will swing in whatever direction the field lines are. Nice. What does your, so here's a, a third way of writing the, writing the question. What does my compass needle do if I'm in the Lamborghini going 100 meters per second to the left? And students, the answer to that problem is the very beginning of the theory of relativity. It is exactly the question that Albert Einstein asked when he started developing his theory of relativity. And as I've said before, we live in a four-dimensional space-time. And this is the traditional doorway into that whole theory. What does the observer see? Okay, source of electromagnetic fields. Electromagnetic fields are generated when charges accelerate. Okay, so instead of going at a straight 100 meters per second, yeah, we can do that. If they accelerate, either changing direction or speeding up or slowing down, they're going to see, uh, or they're going to generate electromagnetic fields. In other words, um, radiation will be emitted. We see this in electronics. A coil of wire. Crystals. If you, if you shake a crystal with an electric field, it will generate electromagnetic fields. The aurora borealis. Oh boy. Raise your hand if you've ever seen the northern lights. Me, I've seen Oh, usually there's one or two. I don't see a single person there. 
if you're ever up north, especially in the summer, you know, so if you go up to Maine, or if you go up to Montana, or Alaska, the land of the midnight sun, keep your eyes out for the northern lights. It's amazing. Um, and the northern lights are basically a huge amount of electric charges interacting with the magnetic field of the Earth. Okay, so all those those field lines going into the South Pole, the S Pole of Earth. Um, and it's mostly electrons and protons that blaze off the surface of the sun. You know, the sun's always burning off a lot of stuff. You know, it's all ionized hydrogen, plasma, and so a lot of stuff. And it's what we call the solar wind. And most of it is, uh, is protons and electrons. And then when they hit the, the uh, when, when they get to Earth, and they get jammed into our magnetic field, they kind of spin around and, and circle around in the magnetic field, and that causes these um, beautiful uh, aurora borealises, the northern lights. Uh, so the, the magnetic field accelerating charges, and you know, anytime you have a change in the energy, if you know, here's one, one way to think about it. Um, Acceleration frequently occurs if you have a change in speed, either a slowdown or a speed up. That corresponds to um, change in the kinetic energy. In general, uh, change in the kinetic energy is accompanied by a change in the potential energy. And so um, the, the whole idea of accelerating uh, charges generating uh, electromagnetic fields um, is even applicable to the atom. And so let's talk about uh, the atom now. Now we're getting down to the, the nitty-gritty. Now let's remember what Rutherford talked about. Here's a picture of old Professor Rutherford. He fired those alpha particles. And they have a charge of plus 2e. Okay. It's the nucleus of a of an helium atom, we now know. Fired him at the thin gold foil. He detected backscatter, so the, the alpha particle is interacted with something else that's positively charged. And what he did was analyze the angles and speeds um, and the electrical potential energy. And he was able to place an upper limit on the size of the gold nucleus. He did a ton of calculus. He used the Coulomb interaction and a ton of calculus, a ton of trig, and he figured out that the nucleus is very, very teeny compared to the atom. So the electrons are orbiting out here, and they kind of define the outer edge of the atom, but the nucleus that he got backscatter from, uh, and he figured it out, it's actually very teeny. And he said at most, the nucleus is one 100,000th of the atom, diameter for diameter. So the electrons are out here, 100, you know, somewhere 100,000 units out, and the nucleus down here, one unit. And so his, his, the Rutherford model was that electrons orbit a really teeny positive nucleus, a lot like a planet orbits the sun. The planets orbit the sun by the gravitational interaction, what we call universal gravitation, and that's not a, um, relevant in an atom because it's so weak, but the atom, the little, uh, ele the electrons and the teeny positive charge, the, the nucleus, the teeny positive nucleus, um, holds the electrons in orbit with the electromagnetic interaction, the Coulomb interaction. And because that is the case, figuring out electrical potential energy um, and different orbital levels of electrons um, is a valid thing to study. So here's, here's how we usually denote it. And the, the, these little blue electrons, you know, whizzing around, this is the standard uh, way that you look at a, or you, you represent an atom. Now, this is not really a very accurate view of an atom in quantum mechanics, 
But for the day of Rutherford, this was all right. And it's still all right for first approximations. Here's, an, here's another picture. Um, and let's work out this, this ratio, 1 over 100,000. If you say that the nucleus is the size of a basketball, then how far um, apart are the electrons that are in orbit? All right. So if a basketball is equal to 1, then, and, and if that represents our nucleus, then 100,000 basketballs is what? Well, in real life, a basketball is about 24 centimeters, 0.24 meters. So 100,000 of them would be about 24,000 meters or 24 kilometers. Okay? So if, if, the, if the basketball... Uh, represent of the nucleus, the size of the atom would be about 24 kilometers. That's about 14 miles. Now let's figure out uh, what 14 miles is um, away from UCF. It's halfway across Orange County. All right, so for example, let's start at the student union and I'd like you to give me if you can, mentally, raise your hand if you can suggest something that's about 14 miles away from UCF. Think. Raise your hand. Yeah, what do you think? Excuse me? Downtown Orlando? Uh, is a little closer than that. Not bad. Fashion Square Mall? Uh... You know what? It might take 14 miles to drive it. But as a crow flies, Fashion Square is a little bit, Fashion Square Mall's closer than downtown. Okay? So, but you're getting in the right ballpark. How about this? Orlando International Airport. Yeah, I figured it out. I used the Google Maps here. Uh, from, from the subway in the Student Union to Starbucks and Terminal A, that's about 21.554 kilometers, 13 point. All right, so that's the, that's the diameter of your atom. If the nucleus is a basketball. So the, the upshot is the volume of an atom is mostly empty space. And just think about it. You know, you, you've got a basketball, right? Okay, and it's atoms. So its electrons are out there on orbit, maybe at UCF or maybe down at the airport, and your basketball's down here in the, in the center somewhere. And you don't know where it is. It's, you know, how are you going to find a basketball between, one basketball between here and the airport? Forget about it. But that's what an atom is. So, so, you know, trying to locate the electron and trying to locate the pro. But we've done it. I mean, Rutherford did it. He bagged it. He got backscattered. He knocked those, a bunch of those alpha particles into this unbelievably lonely, all by itself, Nucleus. So, now, these electrons, you know, they're on an orbit. And in this picture, um, they're going around in a circle. And a circle, you have acceleration. All right? So, you're, so classically speaking, May, um, those electrons on orbit should be radiating away electromagnetic radiation because they're accelerating. Why doesn't that happen? Why is an atom stable? Okay. Why doesn't an, an electron, as it orbits, it's accelerating on its orbit? We know that that's the case, 
but it's not radiating energy away. It, 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 should, it should collapse. It should spiral down into the nucleus, but it doesn't. All right, so let's do some more clicking here. Let's, and I'm going to kind of psych your mind here and ask you a question about rainbows, but it's related. And let me start this question. This optical device breaks up sunlight into a rainbow. This should be very easy for you guys. 20 seconds to vote. Ten seconds to vote. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right, let's see what you guys got here. Yeah. Prism and diffraction grading is good. So I'll give both of you points for that. Um, Which color has the shortest wavelength? We need to know all this stuff to understand atoms. Roy G. Biv. Which of the Roy G. Biv wavelengths is the shortest? 15 seconds to vote. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Uh oh, oh, well, uh, that's not hopeless. Um, the correct answer, of course, is violet. Uh, for those of you that chose red, 24%, uh, um, yeah, that's actually the opposite. That's the longest wavelength. So anyway, so let's talk about the structure of hydrogen and its electron orbits. And now, my wonderful students, we're going to look at the quantum theory of hydrogen. So here we go. A hydrogen is a proton and an electron. So this little blue circle up here represents an electron. And these are different orbital levels. And you can think of this as different orbits that, you know, like a space shuttle and a communication satellite, and spy satellite. You know, they all have different orbital levels and stuff like that. Now, what they found when they looked at the light from hydrogen, as we did with diffraction gratings, that only certain wavelengths were produced if you had a pure source of hydrogen. Okay, we got the beautiful H alpha line, we got H beta and H gamma, and I think a few of you saw H delta, kind of purpley blue. H gamma and H delta are kind of purpley blue. Those are the only orbital levels allowed. So the theory is that the, and, and this is a theory developed by Einstein and a fellow named Niels Bohr. Um, the theory is that uh, when an atom drops from one orbit to another, that's when it changes its electrical potential energy and emits some electromagnetic radiation. And so the structure of the hydrogen, the first thing you got to do is number the orbits. And what they found was that nothing made sense unless you, fit, unless you accounted for the orbits as a finite, and not a finite, but as a countable set of orbits. So unlike the space shuttle, unlike the space station, unlike a spy satellite or any other... Um, spacecraft, you can't put an electron in a hydrogen atom 
at any altitude you like. Only certain altitudes and the orbits are countable. Make a note of that. All right? They're countable. So n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. And so the idea is that the H alpha, the beautiful red H alpha photon, is emitted when the electron jumps from n equals 3 down to n equals 2. Okay? From the second excited state, oh, did I say that? Yes. Down to the first excited state. And then what's this one down here? Well, we don't call it the fundamental. You know what we call this one down here? n equals 1? We call that the ground state. That's the lowest. When you get to that, you've hit the ground, you can't go any further, the ground state. And so the theory is that they worked out is that beautiful red H alpha is third orbit down to the second orbit. Second excited state down to the first excited state. And when it does that, it emits a red H alpha photon. Now here's a picture of the two guys that figured this out. Niels Bohr, go ahead and write those two names down. Niels Bohr and Albert Einstein. And this is about, this is like 1905, 1909, 19, in there. They kind of figure this stuff out. And in the years after that. And so they assume basically that, that the structure of the orbits um, and the, si the colors of the photons correspond to very specific energies. So every photon that's emitted change is, is emitted because it changes from one potential energy state down to a lower one. And they said that that's very specific energy states allowed, or energy changes allowed. And they're all countable, and they correspond to the different colors. So, as the electron drops to the lower electrical potential energy orbit, it emits a photon. It loses potential energy, and that goes into the energy of the outgoing photon. All right? So, H alpha is this one from n equals 3 down to n equals 2. Now, if you have some hydrogen, and the electron is in the n equals 2 state, it can absorb an H alpha, and when it does that, it'll bump the electron upward to n equals 3. Right? And so these are the uh, n equals 4. Here's the proton in the center. Um, let's take a look at the spectrum of hydrogen. Here's a fairly good picture of it. These are the only colors that hydrogen produces when you break it up like a prism or a diffraction grating. Okay, now H alpha we've talked about, and we've seen this. We saw it on the very first day of class. Here's H beta. I think everybody saw that. And here's H gamma and H delta. A little tougher to see in the lecture hall, but you can see them a lot of times. Okay, so uh, H alpha is N equals 3 down to N equals 2. Um, H beta is N equals 4 down to N equals 2. All right, now... N equals 4 is a higher state, bigger energy change, Caitlin, more energy, smaller wavelength. Let me repeat that. From N equals 4 down to N equals 2, bigger energy change, delta EPA E is bigger, photon has more energy, more energy, Smaller wavelength. Therefore, it's not red. It's kind of bluish green. Almost kind of an aqua color. H beta. H gamma. N equals 5 down to N equals 2. All right? Even bigger energy change from N equals 5 all the way down to N equals 2. A lot more energy. Okay, so... So H gamma, even more delta EPE. So the photon has more energy. 
Therefore, it has an even tighter wavelength, and we see it in the, down in the purples, down in the bluish violet. And then here's the last one, n equals 6 down to n equals 2. So H delta, whoa, you're really getting some energy here. You're getting more than H alpha, more than H beta, more than H gamma. And so you're way down there in the deep purples, the violets. And my wonderful students, this series of colors is known as the Balmer series, after a guy named Joseph Balmer that kind of figured it out. He figured out the numerical pattern for this. And it is like the universal fingerprint of hydrogen. So when an astronomer uh, looks out through his telescope at a star and, you know, his, his telescope has got a big aperture, it's got a big eye, and so it gathers a lot of starlight compared to your just regular eyeball. So he funnels, he focuses all that starlight down onto a diffraction grating. If he sees these colors and only these colors, he knows that he's got a lot of hydrogen. And my wonderful students, astronomers, see this all the time. And that's how we know that about 74% of the visible universe is hydrogen. Because these fingerprints reveal themselves all over the place. Everywhere we look. Everywhere we can see a star, hydrogen. Here's a picture of a guy named Louis de Broglie. And Louis de Broglie was, became famous for trying, he's a French guy. He was, he was a soldier in World War I. And soon after that, he tackled this particular question in Paris. Why is an atom stable? In other words, okay, you have these orbits, but why do you even have these orbits? Okay, we know that it doesn't spiral down, but why, I mean, and, and so we know that, you know, the Bohr theory, um, yeah, quantized orbits, you know, countable orbits. You better write that word down, quantized orbits. The orbits are quantized. Um, in other words, you can count them. Okay, they have a, it's a countable set. You know, one, two, three, all the way up. So Bohr and Einstein said, yeah, this, this seems to be the case that only these orbits are allowed, but nobody figured out why. You know, nobody, you know, because F equals MA does not give you Countable. F equals ma gives you a spiral. You spiral all the way in. You leave you leave energy behind, and as that energy is radiated out, um, you spiral into the nucleus. And we, they knew that that wasn't the case. So they knew the atom was stable, but they didn't really know why. You know, they knew that these orbits were countable and that they corresponded to the beautiful colors, Melanie, of the hydrogen spectrum. They had that bag. Yeah. N equals 1, N equals 2, N equals 3. Yeah, we got that. But why is there even, you know, why is that restricted? You know, what's the reason for a restriction to certain altitudes? Let me repeat that question. Why an atom is stable is the same as asking, why are the orbits restricted to certain altitudes and no others? Okay? Bohr figured out that if you restrict them to certain altitudes, all the spectra work out perfectly. But he didn't know why. If you would have gone up to Niels Bohr or Einstein and said, all right, smart guy, why are they restricted? Why are only those altitudes permitted, Ann? And you would have been, you know, they would have said, dude, I don't know, you know. Can you go get me a Starbucks or maybe I'll... That might help. But this guy, Louis de Broglie, he's the one that figured out. Here's what, here's what he said. You know, he said, look, we know that light uh, 
behaves as a wave. Right? And when it goes through a diffraction grating, it does what only waves can do. Particles will never do that. Particles will just go through. They, they won't form wavelets or anything. But waves do that. And what de Broglie says, if you think of the electrons as having essential wave properties, in other words, a particle that is also a wave, then everything works out. And this is a fairly radical proposition. Because prior to that, you know, like J.J. Thompson would have said, yeah, those electrons, they're, you know, they have a mass, they have a charge, they're little particles, we can put them where we want them, TVs work on the basis of the electron being a particle. No problem. Now you're telling me, De Broglie, now J.J. Thompson, he might, I don't know, he might have still been alive. If he wasn't, J.J. Thompson was rolling over in his grave. What? An electron that's also a particle and also a wave? You know what that's like? It's like saying, you know, a particle, very specific location, kinetic energy, um, mass, everything. It's like a bookcase, right? You put a book up there on the shelf, it's either the first shelf or the third shelf, and it's left or right, you know, everything's, you know. It's like a bookcase. But telling me that an electron is a thing that is a particle that behaves as a wave, or that it's a wave that behaves like a particle, that's like telling me that I have a bookcase that is also a horse. What? And just think of a horse. Beautiful animal. You know, they like apples and stuff. They could be your friend. You know, running around, they, you can climb mountains. You can't climb mountains with a bookcase. You can't run a race with a bookcase. Bookcases are nice. A bookcase that is also a horse, but that's what we got here. And my wonderful students, it is true. The electron is not, don't use the word wave particle duality. There's nothing dual about it. It is a wave that behaves like a particle. A particle that behaves like a wave. It's essential. They're both the same. It's both things in, in one. So, how does nature select these orbits? Okay, Einstein. How does nature select those orbits? I don't know, man. But if I get a Starbucks here in the next five minutes, I might figure out. Hey, De Broglie, how does nature select those orbits? Well... I think it works out like this. If they have wave properties, then they have a wavelength. And if it curves, if it has just the right wavelength, it will curve on its orbit. It will get all the way around, just like when... Uh, Caroline and Darian were doing standing waves. They sent out one wave, and it reflected from Darian and came back. And if you do it exactly the right wavelength, you get a standing wave. If the electron wave has exactly the right wavelength, it'll fit perfectly onto the orbit. And that, my wonderful students, is how nature selects only certain orbits. Only certain orbits will you get constructive interference. Okay? Now, we know that this is the case on a guitar. And that's why we need a guitar on Tuesday. What's your name? Uh, guitar student. What's your name? Carrie? Carolina? Okay. Carolina's going to bring her guitar. And you didn't know that you're going to be talking about atoms and stuff. You're going to be dim yeah. We know that oh, if, if you specify the length of a guitar string, 
and the, the mass of the guitar string, and you tighten it to a certain tension, you'll get a G, right? I mean, that's one of the notes, right? Right? And then if you use the fingerboard, you can get a different note because you artificially make the string a different length. But if you do something that's not at that specific length, you get something that sounds sour. You know, you're at church and, and somebody's singing a solo and they hit us the wrong note and all the dogs in the neighborhood start going, oh, you know, because they don't. That's what I feel like whenever I hear somebody hit a sour note. But, we, but Adams never hit sour notes. They always have the right ones. Now, I want you to see figure 8.5 if possible. I think that's the right figure. Now, here's what de Broglie's hypothesis boiled down to. He said this. If you use Planck's radiation constant H, and you say that the wavelength is controlled by the momentum, and by Planck's constant H with this formula, lambda equals H over mv, that will give you exactly the right wavelength to fit exactly in the orbit. Only those orbits. So, only those orbits, only those energies, only those momenta that give you constructive interference. And this is the law, this is the formula that controls all of that. All right, here it is again. Lambda equals H over MV momentum. That's the, called the de Broglie relation. Now, Let me let me go over here. Here we go. All right. On Tuesday, we're going to talk about this constant. This is Planck's constant. And as a sneak preview, I'll tell you what the units of Planck's constant are. In the quantum theory of the electron, H has the units of angular momentum. All right, you're dismissed. We'll see you next time. Regular homework and mega review over the weekend. See you on Tuesday.